Welcome back to To The Point. Peter, we're about to talk to the Minister for uh, Environment and what, what, Energy. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you, what were his responsibilities? I could remember that they were completely contradictory, but I couldn't remember what They're they not were. not contradictory at all. If you're an advocate for energy, then that's hard to also no. be an advocate for the environment unless no, you're no, purely renewable, advocating Peter, renewable energy. This, this minister, I've heard him say See, some very positive... the Minister for Renewable Energy. I've heard him say some very positive things about renewable his energy. His conservative colleagues will love that. Mm, Josh Frydenberg. Let's bring him in, shall we? Indeed. Welcome to To The Point. Nice to be with you both. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even sound like you meant that. Look, I want to ask you a, a genuine question. You guys have only been in government for essentially one term at this stage. Uh, is anyone going to leave you in a job long enough to get something accomplished? I mean, you were responsible Aww. for red tape. You got moved on. You were assistant treasurer. They moved you on. You were put in charge of resources. They Northern moved you Territory, on. Northern Territory, Northern Australia. Now, Northern Australia. Now you're in charge of energy. What is it? And the environment. environment. Um, my, my prediction is that they're going to move you on in the next reshuffle. It's unfair. They should let you finish the job. Well, Peter, um, <laughs> it won't surprise you to hear that I've enjoyed all those different portfolios. Um, they have been extremely different and we've achieved a lot in, in each of them. But uh, there has been a change in Prime Minister. There has been numerous reshuffles and, and uh, you take whatever you're given by the Prime Minister of the day. And I'm very fortunate that I've seen an increase in my portfolio responsibilities. That is true. You've over kept the last getting promoted. A bit years. Mm. Okay, so you have been promoted. You've got energy and environment. I mean, these are really difficult issues in, in many ways, particularly for a conservative government. I'm just going to, to <laughs> say, um, you know, in your you've been in the portfolio about four weeks. Have you formed a view about the use of renewables? You know, Labor's got a 50% target there. I mean, you're. You're, you must be thinking about how do we use renewables as part of the energy mix. And for the record, I actually think that there are enormous synergies between the two. I was only joking before. It makes sense <laughs> to bring the two together, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I mean, that, that is the first point to say, Peter, which is this was an important machinery of government change. Uh, energy and climate change are increasingly seen as two sides of the same coin. So bringing these portfolios together has been welcomed by all sides of politics. Uh, because of the synergies that they bring. Uh, renewables, uh, Christina, are absolutely critical to our energy mix. They make, make up about 15% today. Uh, a little over a decade ago, they were half that. Uh, and they're expected to go to 23% by 2020 because we have this mandated bipartisan mm. legislated target. Now, Labor's 50% target by 2030 is completely unrealistic uh, and it would be extremely problematic uh, to, to get there because the the challenge we have with renewables, particularly solar and wind, is that they are of an intermittent nature, meaning when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine, energy is not being produced. And this has raised real questions of stability across the national electricity market, and that will be one of the topics we'll be discussing with the mm. COAG energy ministers tomorrow. But I, I have to say renewables are here, to, uh, are here to stay. They're an important part of the energy mix, and they are increasing... Uh, over time. So is it just the technological challenges that concern you about Labor's target? I mean, battery storage, we know, is one of the key things that yeah. is going to have to um, advance, uh, innovate, if you will, uh, before we can uh, really rely on renewable. Uh, but is it also about cost and, is, and the impact, yeah. the transition out of the coal um, fueled electricity supply? You know, what, what, unpack a bit what your concerns are. Well, cost is an issue because uh, at the moment uh, to produce a uh, megawatt hour of electricity from solar or wind is considerably more than from gas, which again is considerably more from coal, although those costs are coming down. So in the last seven years, um, the costs of uh, generating electricity from solar has come down by uh, about 50% and from wind by about 80%. Now, technology is the, is the real swing factor in all of this, and you put your finger on when you mentioned battery storage, uh, because currently we don't have the capacity to store uh, the renewable uh, energy or the intermittent energy uh, in, the, in, in the way that we would like to across the grid. But the costs of batteries will come down by about 60% over the next decade, which will make it a lot more usable in the home for those 15% of households with solar PV, but also for industrial size 
batteries that can be used by some of the major uh, energy users across industry. Mm. Uh, tomorrow, as you say, you do have got the COAG Energy Council meeting. Uh, one of the issues for the agenda is gas price and supply. There's a continued mm -hmm. push from unions and from industry uh, for a gas reservation policy in Australia. Is that something you're going to be talking about and, and what's your view on that? Well, this idea of a gas reservation policy was put forward by Chris Bowen, uh, dare I say it, in a jointly authored op-ed op -ed with the uh, head of the AWU uh, in the financial review during the election campaign. Quite a strange uh, situation indeed where the shadow treasurer had co-authored a piece okay, with the AWU. Okay, I'll let you make and that I, political point, but there are industries... I reckon it's a, I reckon it's no, a good no, point, I, though. That's but, a bit ridiculous. But, but, but there are industries as well that are pushing for this. It's not just a push yeah. from the unions. But I rejected it at the time uh, very strongly by saying that the best advice to government, and the ACCC recently put out a report, mm. uh, said that if you have a domestic reservation, you will drive investment and exploration offshore because there won't be the incentive for companies to spend the billions of dollars that is needed to create the gas markets here to then uh, earn export income mm. abroad. And if you look at what happened over 10 years ago, Queensland was looking to import gas from Papua New Guinea. And then suddenly you had all these uh, foreign companies mainly, but also some domestic, investing in coal seam gas and further exploration activities. And now we will become the world's largest LNG exporter in the world by 2020. Mm. That wouldn't have happened without the exposure to those export markets and the billions of dollars that that brings. So I, I'm very much against a reservation policy. So mm. was Gary Gray. So was Martin Ferguson. In fact, Martin Ferguson called it an investment killer. Uh, look, uh, for what it's worth, uh, I tend to agree with you and uh, your, the esteemed list of people you just uh, rattled off there. It's a bit of a, I see it as a form of protectionism almost uh, and means we don't get the full value of our asset uh, here in Australia. But, uh, Peter, you, well, you, you, you know, you, you, your turn to grill the minister a bit. Se separate issue. Uh, do you agree with Tony Abbott that in hindsight you should have supported the Malaysian solution? Well, I noticed that Tony Abbott, even when he made that speech, Peter, said that uh, he didn't think it was going to work, but he wanted to stop that, uh, that hyperactivity around the partisanship of the parliament. Looking back in retrospect, it may have taken a different position, but I don't think it, I don't think it would have worked. And Jim Molan, uh, I noticed somebody who's been involved in, uh, in the border protection space doesn't think it was going to work. And the 800 people that were going to go to Malaysia wouldn't have even made up one month of the number of people... So you don't agree at with Tony Abbott? No, I don't agree. Okay. I didn't support it at the time and I don't support it now. All right, the other one I want to ask you about is he also wants to crack open the debate on 18C, mm. albeit with a sort of <laughs> grey compromise position rather than a black or white one. Uh, you were a bit of a fan of doing something about 18C. Is that still your view? <laughs> well, um, Peter, as you know, uh, it was on the table back in 2014. Tony Abbott took it off the table uh, and, and now is off the table. And my, my friend and colleague, Matthias Kuhlman, earlier today stated the position of the government, which is we won't be initiating a change uh, to 18C. We've outlined our legislative priorities uh, and we'll have a busy time uh, prosecuting them through the parliament when it resumes in the week after next. OK, so you're not going to... The government's not going to initiate a change, but Senator Cory Bernardi is going to put forward a private member's statement. Surely the government... A private member's bill, excuse me. Surely the government's going to have to take a position and, on that. And your colleague, your Victorian <laughs> colleague, Senator James Patterson, he reckons that you might be very close to having the numbers in the Senate. Well, look, obviously, uh, Cory is a backbencher. James is too. Um, I'm bound by Cabinet solidarity. Uh, our position is not to initiate that. Uh, change to 18C. It's been uh, mentioned many times by George Brandis since. And, you know, Corey's obviously free to, to do what he would like in this regard, but the government's position is clear. It sounds like, though, what you're saying, you're bound by Cabinet Solidarity translation. Uh, you'd love to support them, but you can't. I mean, that's certainly the view of <laughs> Senator... That's You're certainly, such a verbal that's certainly the view My of goodness. Senator Zedzer I get the impression. We know that because when he was a backbencher, he supported a private member's bill of exactly this type, and now that he's got responsibility on the front bench for multicultural affairs, uh, suddenly, like you, he's bound by front bench solidarity. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, there is going to be lots of different views, Peter, across the parliament and, and indeed across the party 
uh, on this on this issue because it's been around for some time. But the government has announced what its priorities are, and particularly the changes around the CFA and protection for those 60,000 volunteers in Victoria, the, uh, the uh, omnibus bill about the savings that we want to get through, the uh, Australian Building Construction Commission and the registered organisation bills. They're really important to mm. the economic uh, future of this country, and, and that's where our attention will be focused. Mm. How uncomfortable about, are you uh, about people that have been deemed to be <laughs> genuine refugees uh, being in indefinite detention mm for three years and counting now, and I, I say that because I think about mm. historical points in time uh, where refugees have fled persecution equally as genuine are refugees uh, and not been forced into indefinite incarceration in many respects as a consequence. Uh, are you uncomfortable with that policy? Well, Peter, this is an extremely vexed issue and there are no, uh, I think, black or white areas. In fact, I think it's all uh, areas of grey because we saw Kevin Rudd, and it may have been for the best of intentions, try to unwind uh, John Howard's uh, effective border protection policies when he came to government at the end of 2007, and that had disastrous consequences. Uh, so we saw uh, tragically more than a thousand people lose their lives at sea, 8,000 children in detention, 17 detention centres opened, and of course our relationships. Uh, with some of our key neighbours being strained. Now, we came to government with a commitment to, to change that, and despite the difficulty, uh, we were very successful. And Scott Morrison, and subsequently Peter Dutton, and Tony Abbott, now Malcolm Turnbull, deserve a lot of, a lot of credit for that. Uh, so, yes, we do uh, have very difficult choices to make, and you've heard what Peter Dutton and, uh, and the uh, the PNG government have said about the future of Manus, uh, the situation on Nauru. Uh, you've had those leaked documents. Um, those, those claims are now all being uh, closely investigated. But there are no easy uh, solutions to this. And I am uh, comfortable overall, to your question, with the government's uh, commitment to strong border protection and the policies we have. Uh, look, we might uh, move off uh, this area and back to your portfolio, which you may or may not welcome. Uh, you're with the meeting <laughs> <laughs> with the meeting tomorrow, you are the New South Wales Energy Minister in the room, Anthony Roberts. Uh, you know they've just had this bruising experience of trying to sell Ausgrid. Uh, you know, I've got to think that you've got a little bit of sympathy for them. I mean, here's an electric, an energy asset they're trying to sell, urged on by your government in terms of the asset recycling scheme. Similar, Christina, to you know what's going on in South Australia, gas mm -hmm. in New South Wales, ports up in the Northern yeah. Territory, yet some sort of differentiation this time. Yeah, I mean, do you have some kind of sympathy for them? Should there be clear advice given about whether energy assets, certain energy assets are on or off the table in terms of foreign investment? Well, the energy sector is effectively divided into the generators of that electricity, mm -hmm. the distributors, the transmitters and the retailers. And across the country in different states, we have many foreign owners of those different assets. But each asset is different in the services that it provides in the scale. Uh, and obviously this one had particular national security implications. So that is why the Treasurer, and it wasn't a unilateral decision, it was on the best advice of the agencies who are expert in this area, uh, recommended that the sale not go ahead. And I think we just have to accept that uh, as it is and understand that this country has a warm and welcoming approach to foreign investment. And indeed, in 2013-14, we uh, approved more than $160 billion worth of uh, foreign investment into this country. And it comes from all four corners of the globe. And I saw it in the resources sectors being absolutely critical. And I see it in the energy sector as being absolutely mm. critical. But we will, not, we will not compromise on national security implications. And I don't think the Australian people would expect us to. You mentioned resources, uh, your previous portfolio and your current portfolio of energy, a lot to do with Western Australia, obviously, as the resource hub of the nation. Uh, you would have heard uh, Michaelia Cash uh, earlier today, I'm guessing, uh, a West Australian senator responsible uh, for employment. Uh, she was quite delighted by the employment numbers that came out today showing uh, that there's been a 0.1% drop in the unemployment rate. But interestingly, in her excitement, I'm surprised as a West Australian senator, she didn't note that unemployment in Western Australia has gone up mm. from 5.7% to 6.3%. Nearly 8,500 West Australians added to the unemployment rate 
an unbelievably bad number for the great state of WA? Well, there are real challenges in the resource sector across the country. Uh, not because volumes are going down, but because we've seen an increase in supply. Uh, so, for example, we are exporting, uh, you know, two or three times the amount of iron ore and coal than we were as a country a decade ago. But so is Vale in Brazil or other country companies uh, across the world, and that means that the increase of supply has uh, put a dampener on price, and that has led to uh, some of those marginal cost producers in Western Australia being put out of business and of course jobs, jobs have been shed. So Western Australia and parts of Queensland, the Bowen Basin for example, uh, have seen uh, major job losses and that makes it very tough and that's why for example Peter you've seen the GST debate mm. become a little bit more sharpened in recent mm. days and... and uh, Derek Abetz isn't you know, happy Colin about Barnett. it. <laughs> sure, I mean there's going to be, you know, people are going to speak to their own book on that um, mm. but uh, seeing Western Australia just get 30 cents in the dollar doesn't seem a fair deal to me. Mm. Josh Frydenberg, that's all that we've got time for. Thanks so much for Thanks coming for your company. to the point. Great to be with you guys. Mm. Bye. Okay.